that Jesus is not poor. It's you and me. We all come in this world naked. We bring nothing in. When we die, we take nothing out. And between life and death, we're merely trustees of the material things of life. So we're spinning up the second part of a message from Stanley Tam on this episode of the Pathway to Purpose podcast. I'm your host, Ken Powell. And here at FCCI, we love to feature some of these incredible testimonies from the Christian Leader Archives. And if you didn't catch part one of this story from Stanley Tam, make sure you listen to episode 40 of our podcast. Well, on this episode, you'll hear Stanley talk about his considerable effort to engage in worldwide teaching and training and that heart to serve others and help build the kingdom of God around the globe is at the core of FCCI's vision to transform the world through Christ, one company leader at a time. In fact, Stanley is a shining example of the FCCI mission statement, which states, in pursuit of Christ's eternal objectives, we equip and encourage Christian business leaders to operate their businesses and conduct their personal lives in accordance with biblical principles. Well, I've been incredibly encouraged as Stanley talks about taking one step of faith after another and how God really showed up and continued to empower Stanley's devotion to remain faithful to his calling. Listen as he launches into a powerful reminder of which bank is receiving our deposits. Here's Stanley. I want to read a scripture to you in the sixth chapter of John. If I can uh, see here, I think I'll read it. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves who break through and steal. But here's what he wants us to do. Lay up for yourself. Do you ever see that word yourself? Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. What we do is just exchange banks. We take it out of the bank on earth, put it in the bank of heaven. And uh, that's a good bank. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I was speaking in Detroit, Michigan. A lady came to the altar. I went down. I said, could I pray for you? She looked up at me. She said, Mr. Tam, why don't I grow spiritually in my Christian life? I said, what kind of a ministry do you have here in the church? Oh, she said, I don't have one. I said, what kind of a ministry do you have outside the church? Oh, she said, I don't have one. I said, uh, lady, you'll never grow spiritually until you have a ministry. Oh, I guess that's my problem. I don't want to be obligated to God for a ministry. Well, I said, then there's no use for us to pray. And that's one of the great truths in the Bible. If you want to grow spiritually, you need a ministry. During the vacation Bible school exercise at our church, I saw a lady that was a stranger. She had two little girls. I went up and introduced myself. I said, are these your girls? She said, the one is, but the other is uh, my neighbors. This is the first time she's ever been in a church. And every time somebody walked through the door, she said, is that Jesus? And every time I had to say no, she said then, why can I find Jesus in this church? That was a searching question, wasn't it? But then she said when they took the offering, she leaned over and said, is Jesus poor? I think we all realize tonight that Jesus is not poor. It's you and me. We all come in this world naked. We bring nothing in. When we die, we take nothing out. And between life and death, we're merely trustees of the material things of life. And so... If you would uh, come to visit our factory in Lima, Ohio, right at the front door, you see a bronze plaque about this square that says property is a sacred trust from the Lord. In 1952, my life was completely changed. In 1952, I was invited to go around the world to speak as a Christian layman. And when the song leader and I got to Tokyo, We had a desire to go to Korea. This is when the Korean War was on. We thought we had a a message for the church that was in war. We went to the United States Army, said, could we go to Korea? 
Seven days later, we got the necessary papers. We flew the 800 miles over to Pusong, Korea. And night after night, we spoke in the churches there. Nothing like we have here in America. They didn't have beautiful electric lights like we had. They had kerosene, gas lights. They didn't have chairs to sit in. They sat on the floor. They didn't have heat in their churches. We spoke every night with our overcoats on. But they had something in their churches we don't have in the United States. An early morning prayer meeting from 5 to 6 o'clock in the morning where the churches are packed out to the wall. And these go on in practically all the churches. My wife and I were just there. And these, these prayer meetings continue to go on in South Korea. And night after night, we spoke in these churches in South Korea. Had the privilege of going up to Seoul within 28 miles of the fighting line. But one night, I said to the missionary, I can't speak in these churches anymore. He said, why? I said, I discovered something. It isn't me that has the message, it's these people. Out here in the daytime, I see these people living on the side of the mountain in cardboard boxes and canvas tents right in the heart of the winter. And they have the same winters that we have in Ohio. You tell me, every family has escaped a death, has had a death, a mother, a father, a child has been taken because the adverse conditions they're living under. You tell me they've lost all their earthly possessions because they've been pushed back and forth so, by, so many times by these two armies. And here I come from rich America. I come over here to tell these people how to live the Christian life. When out here, I see them bringing their lost souls. And every night, the altars filled, are filled with their diamonds. And here I come from rich America. I'm, I live in a comfortable home. I've never lost any of my loved ones. I never lost any of my earthly possessions. How can I stand in these pulpits and tell them how to live the Christian life? The next morning, I come out the breakfast table, and only men missionaries were there because of the war. I said to those men around the table, God's been speaking to me. I've got to make God a fresh and anew for my own personal Christian life. I said, would you excuse me today from going with you on your itinerary? I've got to make God in a new way. After they left, I went back. That room was mine. Over that army cot, it was my bed. And with my overcoat on, because I don't think there was any heat in South Korea. And night after that day, I began to pray. And I said, Lord, why is it I have this heavy burden of prayer? Is it you would have me to take a step of faith and double my missionary pledge? And at that time, back in 1952, I was trusting God for $5,000 for a missionary pledge. And to double it at that time would have been a great step of faith. But I offered it to God. I offered it to the second time, the third time. But seemingly, God wasn't interested. He began to change the thought of my prayer that, that morning to the book of Ruth, how she went in the field of Boaz, and she actually asked if she could work in his harvest field. And that became my prayer that morning, as I began to ask God if I could work in his harvest field in a new and effective way. And as I was praying, God gave me an offer. Stanley, if you do something, I will do something. If you will just reach out and ask me for the heathen, I will give them to you and the uttermost parts of the world for thy possession. I said, Lord, that's for a missionary. That's at least for a minister. I'm just a lay person. And isn't it easy for each one of us to hide behind that excuse? I'm just a lay person. I prayed on when the Lord gave it to me the second time the third time, and realizing he was speaking to me because I was the only one there, I opened my Bible to the second Psalm, the eighth verse, and I underscored it. I wrote here in my Bible, promise given to me in Pusan, Korea, November the 25th, 1952, based on the book of Ruth. I wrote here on the other side, it's so wonderful to have been spoken to by the Holy Spirit. But I don't understand 
what it means. As I caught the plane to go back to Tokyo, I shuddered under that scripture. How could I believe God for the heathen of the world? Here I was, just a small businessman back in Lima, Ohio. At this time, we were just doing $200,000 gross sales in business. And you businessmen know you don't make much money off of $200,000 gross sales. And then, too, nobody knew about me. I had no resources. How could I believe God for the heathen of the world? But as I caught the plane to go back to Tokyo about halfway back, I left my seat. And uh, when I came back, somebody took my seat. And I said, that's all right, just stay there. There's a lot of empty ones, I'll go up here and take one. I sat next to a Korean who was seated next to the, door, next to the window. I looked at him, I thought, well, he'll, he can't speak English. But I said, hello. He said, hello. I said, you speak English? Oh yes, my father told me if I learn how to speak English, I never have to worry about making money. Well, I studied English in Shanghai for four years. I discovered he was a businessman. Oh, I said, I got a partner in my business I'd like to talk to you about. I began to talk to me about Christianity. And, he's, and I said, he said, uh, well, I'm already a Christian. I said, that's wonderful. Tell me, how did you become a Christian? So he told me this story. I have an uncle in South Korea that's a great Christian. I so admired his life that I decided I would become a Christian tonight. And, uh, but I kept putting it off, putting it off. But one day I said, today, I'm going to become a Christian. And he said, this is the way I've done it. I'm a wealthy man. I have a large home. I've invited all my poor relatives to come and live with me. And I'm supporting them. And I'm sending their children to school because in South Korea, they have private schools. And this way, Mr. Tam, I have become a Christian. I could have rebuked him and said, fellow, there's no way to become a Christian. But I wanted to win him for Christ. I said, Mr. Chung, this thrills me to meet a man like you whose heart pants after God. I say, it's no accident. My seat was taken back there on the plane. God has so arranged it. I could come up and be seated with you that I could share with something. I said, would you be embarrassed if I got my Bible out of my briefcase? No, he said he wouldn't be embarrassed. And so I took my Bible. That day we went through the plan of salvation, answered a lot of questions. When I said, would you like to do what it says here to give, to give your heart to Jesus and your life? He said, this is all missing in my life. Yes, I'd like to do it. And that day he prayed, gave his heart to Christ. I said goodbye to him in Tokyo, figuring I'd never see him again. Tokyo was the largest city in the world. But three days later, I'd run out of Japanese yen money. A missionary so kindly took me right down to the heart of the city. And there was about five, six, six banks. We picked out a bank, went in, stood in line. There was about eight men in line. But when the man at the window turned around, lo and behold, it was Charles Chong. He was surprised to see me as I was to see him. We invited him out to missionary compound. He came that night, gave his first public testimony. And uh, then he began to write me letters in America. Mr. Tam, write me a letter so I can intelligently talk to my wife so she too can know Jesus as her personal savior. The next letter had money in. Would you buy all the Christian literature this money will buy? I want to know more about Jesus Christ. God has said to me, Stanley, I told you, if you would just reach out and ask me for the heathen, I would give them to you. And here was my first earnest. When we got to Hong Kong, staying at a hotel, in a very unusual way, we led another soul to Christ. When we got to India, we led another soul to Christ. Everywhere we went, we began to see souls come to know Jesus. And the Lord would speak to my heart, Stanley, I told you, if you would just ask me, I would give them to you and the uttermost parts of the world for thy possession. But God wasn't through with me yet. After that trip around the world, um, 
the president of a missionary society approached me one day and said, Mr. Tam, one of the problems we have with our churches in South America, they think America has so much money, they'll just send it down, pay all of our bills. Why should we tithe? Supposing you would take uh, your wife and come to South America and speak in our churches there on stewardship. They'll know that you're a lay person like they are, and, uh, and they will know that you paid your own way, and you will relate to them, and you can talk to them about tithing. So my wife and I, we took five weeks to go to South America to speak in the countries of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil. While we were in Colombia, a city called Medellin, a city of over two million, called the drug capital of the world today. We were holding a meeting Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But on Saturday night, we uh, presented a, a testimonial message. And uh, the Spirit of God came upon that service. You could have heard a pin drop at any time. There was something different about this meeting. When I came to the end, I said, we're not going to stand, nor are we going to sing. Should we just bow our heads in prayer? And if God has spoken to your heart, and you'd like to come this old-fashioned altar across the front of the church, would you leave your seat and come? Like that, spontaneous, as if they dove. In, in almost a few instants, the altar was filled across the front of the church, and then it stopped. And you know a speaker, when he's given his burden, he sets down. He's had a release. And, uh, but this night, as I stood behind that pulpit, God began to talk to me. Stanley, what's the greatest value in all, in all the world? As I looked at those souls kneeling there, I knew the answer. For the Bible says, one soul, one soul is the greatest value in all the world. Christian here tonight, do you believe that? Do you believe that one soul is the greatest value in all the world? You know, if you did, your life would be different than what it is today. Your lifestyle, your goals in life would be such that uh, they, would, they would strongly produce that burden in your heart for souls. I wish I had it. But that night God said to me, Stanley, what's the greatest value in all the world? I knew there was only one thing. That was the souls of men. Christ died on the cross for souls, for sinners. Then the Lord spoke to me the second time. Stanley, if a soul is the greatest value in all the world, then what investment can you make in this life that will pay you the greatest dividends a hundred years from now? And it seems as if I went up there a hundred years from now. I turned around. I looked at my life. I saw the home I owned, some money I had in the bank, some investments I had in two companies, this business I was part owner with God. And then I thought, where will all these material things be a hundred years from now? And I realized that the, all these material things that you and I fight for so hard in this life, they all go back to rust, to dust. There was only one investment I could make in this life that would pay dividends a hundred years from now, and they were the spiritual things. Then the God spoke to me the third time. Stanley, if a soul is the greatest value in all the world, and the only investment you can make in this life that will pay dividends a hundred years from now are the spiritual things, would you go back to the United States and turn your entire business over to me and use the prophets to spread the gospel around the world. I argued with the Lord. I said, Lord, already 51% belongs to you. Isn't that enough? Then God spoke to my heart. Stanley, on the cross, I paid it all for you. That you may have the gift of eternal life. Now I live within you. You are my disciple. You are bought with a price. You're to glorify me in your body and your spirit, which belongs to me. You will never know the struggle 
that went through my breast that night. Do you go through it yourself? But as I was struggling, I guess I thought of this. Isn't it wise to give God something I couldn't keep anyway? One day death would come. I'd have to go. And I'd have to leave everything behind. But this way I could transmute it. I could send it all ahead. You know, Henry Ford was a wealthy man. Does anybody here tonight know how much money he left when he died? He left it all, didn't he? And you're going to leave it all too, except that which you give to God. But the only money you'll ever keep is what you give to God. But really, we don't give God anything. Let me prove it to you. Supposing you had $1,000 and you took it down to the bank and put it on deposit in your name. And then you heard the bank loaned it to somebody to help buy an automobile. Would you reason this way? I guess I don't have any money in the bank now. It was spent on that automobile. We all know banking law is better than that. If it's on deposit in your name, it still belongs to you. And you can go down any time and withdraw it. Do you remember the verse we started out with tonight? Lay up for yourself. Have you ever stopped to think about that yourself? What we do is take the money out of the bank on earth and put, the bank, put it in the bank of heaven. When we give God $1,000, he takes that $1,000 and wins a soul. And then he puts that soul on deposit in our name. That's how we become rich toward God. And a soul is the greatest value in all the world. It's worth more than ever, all the buildings and real estate in the United States or the world. One soul is the greatest value to God. Well, the Lord worked on my heart. I said, all right, you can have it all. The next morning, I woke up in that mission station there in South America, and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm confused this morning. That must have been an emotional decision last night. I don't think I can go through with it. I took my Bible out behind some trees on that mission station, struggling. I said, God, you have to give me something from the Bible to stand on. And I think the, the word of God is the only thing you can stand on. And uh, I just let my Bible fall open. Now, I don't think it's a good idea to do that, but I did it. I didn't want to pick out the promise. I wanted God to pick out the promise. I opened my Bible. I looked at a couple of verses that stood out like an engraving. And this is what I read. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man. That seemed to fit. I was a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And who isn't? When he had found one pearl, a great price, he sold everything he had and bought it. Now that speaks of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for each one of us. We are the pearl. And the Lord said, Stanley, you're my disciple. I want you to do the same thing. I said, yes, it took me three weeks to get enough courage to tell my wife I've given away her half the business. <laughs> she took it so well that on the way back from South America, I said, honey, since God owns the business now, we, we ought to build a new factory. And so we built a new factory in 1952, four times larger than the old one. I thought that would take care of me through, through the rest of my life. And to glorify God, we put Christ as the answer on the end of the factory. And then the seven groups of glass, glass, glass windows stood for the perfect number in the word of God. The three posts at the canopy that uh, at the entrance stood for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you see our cornerstone, it says, For no other foundation is laid but that which is laid, Christ Jesus. If you come inside, you see a map of the world. Uh, we got it uh, 8 feet by 20 feet. Now, a map of the world. Because our heart was broken on the mission field, that's what we, where we want to put our money. Now, as I close, I've got to be careful. I don't rob God of any glory. He said, I'll share my glory with no man. But I want to take you back to South Korea, back to 1952, when I said, God, 
Do you want me to double my missionary pledge from 5000 to 10000 No, Stanley, I don't want you to do that. I want to do something for you. And God would like to do something new for each here tonight. He said, Stanley, I've got a ministry for you. And if you accept this ministry, I'll make it possible. Well, 1952 was a long time ago. But the day came when we made a missionary pledge for $500,000. The next year, 600000 The next year, 700000 Then it reached a million. Then it reached two million. Then it reached three million. And now our goal is four million a year for four missions. Do you say we have a great God? Can you see this scripture back in the Old Testament where it says the eyes of the Lord is going through this audience, looking into each one of our hearts tonight to make himself strong in whose heart is perfect toward him. You say, Mr. Tam, I don't have a perfect heart. Oh, but maybe you have. The story goes of a bricklayer who took his little boy to work with him one day when he was called to the telephone for over a half hour. When he came back, his little boy had laid a row of bricks just as crooked as they could be. But he said, Daddy, I want to help you in your work. And Daddy looked at his son and said, Son, you have a perfect heart toward me. Aren't you glad that God looks upon your heart and you can have a perfect heart toward him? George Mueller, that great man of faith that lived in England 200, 200 years ago, said we can soar with God in the graces of God and, re and expect miracles in our life. That's not required for redemption. Out of that trip uh, came a ministry. I went to a missionary society one day. I said, if I could trust God for $50,000 a year, would you start the ever creature crusades? This is going into a country and taking the nationals and form a team of six men that will cover every home of a country in personal work, door to door. And they said yes. And now today, we're in 34 different countries. Our budget has reached 4 million. Last year, they recorded 80,000 decisions and recorded over 200 new churches. That's the fulfillment of that verse that God gave to me. Ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the world for thy possession. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Well, I do hope you have been encouraged by part two of Stanley Tam's message here on this episode. And if you haven't done it recently, would you click over to the FCCI website, find out how you can connect with our webinars, our local events, and so much more. If we can serve your Christian leadership, please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at FCCI. We want to support your calling to transform the world through Christ. And would you let others know about the Pathway to Purpose podcast? Thanks for listening, and may God empower your journey as you lead a company for Christ. Mm -hmm.